The ocular motor nerve is extremely important for two reasons beyond the, uh, it, its role in gaze control, its role in, in having correct vision, in enabling correct vision. And it is, uh, so it, it has two other functions that we're gonna, I'm gonna describe. And then it has a vulnerability that you really need to, to, to know about. Okay, so function number one is what's called the near triad. So by, by the way, this is, our, this is our oculomotor nerve right here. This is the optic nerve, the internal carotid, and here's the um, oculomotor. So the near triad is how one is able to uh, see Tar visual targets that are both, that are far and then see ones that are near. So we are built to see things that are far. That is our default condition. We're seeing stuff that's far and what far is is about uh, 21 feet, about seven meters away. That's what's called optical infinity. And beyond that um, uh, is, is how we are at rest. We are made to see far objects. Now, when we want to see something that's near, we have to fixate on it. And the first part of the, what's called the near triad is convergence. So near triad includes convergence. The second part of the near triad is that the lens rounds up. It increases its refractive power and that it allows you to bend the light more acutely and you get, um, uh, the light is now focused uh, uh, from, onto, the, onto the fovea. So convergence or vergence, um, lens accommodation, which is the rounding up of the lens. And the final part of the near triad is constriction of the pupil. Now that may seem weird. Uh, if any of you uh, have ever heard of, or, or I don't think any of you have done this because it's sort of out of fashion, but there used to be a thing of um, pinhole photography. So if you, take, if you take pictures through a pinhole, what you'll see is that everything is in, in, um, in focus. From a, there's a large depth of field of focus. Why is that? Well, one simple way to think about it is if you have a pinhole, there can be no blur. There's, <laughs> there's only one way to get in. And so everything comes in just right down the pipe right straight down the pipe and comes in and it's in it's in focus and so you'll see that near targets far medium targets far targets are all in focus um that is uh pupillary constriction and the near triad is are those three things if you cannot do those three things you will have difficulty with near vision today for most of us near vision means reading but um, near vision, I think through evolutionary time, did a lot of things, are enabling us to use our hands to pick berries, to pick, uh, to, to, to clean things, to manipulate food, etc. So this is a really important um, function. It's going to bother people if the near triad is, is um, disturbed. And what's sweet about it is that the near triad is a, it's a package deal, and it's a package deal that is all served by the ocular motor uh, nerve. Okay, so everything you need for near vision is in the ocular motor uh, nerve. So what we do is we're looking far, we converge, accommodate, constrict the pupil, and then if we then go back to looking uh, far again, you, you'll see is there, there's not an active uh, divergence, so to speak, there's just a relaxation and it event and the eyes eventually go back to their neutral position going st uh, facing straight ahead. Okay, so near triad is really, really important. The second um, important function that I haven't mentioned yet about the ocular motor nerve is what's called the pupillary light reflex. And the pupillary light reflex is important um, in large part because it's diagnostically extremely useful. So what it is is that you sh if, if you shine light into an eye, um, the, the pupil will constrict. So you're, you're increasing the amount of luminance on that eye. The eye is going to respond by 
uh, constricting the pupil, which is going to decrease the luminance that is entering that eye. And as it turns out, we have this cute little mechanism by which we send that, that signal that there's too much light. We send it across the midline over to the other eye. So here is a, a, um, an illustration of this. We're shining light, typically with a flashlight, um, into the eye. This information about luminance is carried through the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, into the midbrain, as it turns out. Information goes across the midbrain, and, and both on the same side and on the opposite side, it goes out through cranial nerve 3, the ocular motor ner nerve that we're um, talking about, to the uh, ciliary ganglion, which contains the ganglionic neurons that innervate the pupillary constrictor. And so on, the constriction on the same side is called the direct pupillary reflex. The constriction on the opposite side is called the consensual pupillary reflex. You should work your way through what would happen in every one of these conditions. If the cranial nerve won, would you get a consensual or a uh, direct pupillary reflex from this eye or from this eye? Work it through. It's just, a, it's just an exercise in logic. What would happen if this cranial nerve were, um, were damaged. And what would happen, for example, if there was a pinealoma or some other form of, uh, of um, uh, increased pressure in the, in the vellum interpositum that is going to press on the midbrain. And if there is a pressure on the midbrain, it might be that these direct pupillary reflexes are intact, but neither consensual reflex works. Um, this is extremely valuable because you can test this. You don't need a, uh, a participant that is willing and able to participate. The person could be unconscious and you can test this. Okay? The person could be un not verbal and you can test this. This is something that you can test and it's a very, because of that, it's a very valuable tool. Now let's talk about the consequence of ocular motor nerve damage that you need to, to know about. And that is, this, this is, we're looking at the base of the brain. This is the front. This is the back. Here's the temporal lobe. And you see right here, there's a, there's a bump on the medial surface of the temporal lobe. That's called the uncus. Now imagine that there were a lot of pressure up, because there's a stroke or a tumor, there's a lot of pressure up in the uh, brain, and it's so much pressure that this slips down, and we'll see later that it, it may slip under the uh, fold of dura called the tentorium, and it may end up come to uh, press upon the ocular motor nerve. How are you going to know that? Well, you're going to know that because what's going to happen to the pupil? If the, if the ocular motor nerve is not working, it is, remember, it's constricting the pupil. So you have no message of constriction. So what's going to happen? The pupil is going to widen. It's going to blow. Not only is it going to blow, but if, if this ocular motor nerve is not working, there will be no pupillary light reflex. OK? So a blown and unresponsive pupil, this is a medical emergency. It suggests that there's enough pressure that this, that something is pressing on the ocular motor nerve. And pressure that, that reaches the brain stem is, is really quite dangerous. Now, why did I, why, why did we go through all that? The, the, why, what is particular about the blown and unresponsive pupil that is useful? Well, what's particular about it is that you don't need to have a conscious person. Now, by the time pressure builds up here and presses on the ocular motor nerve, this person is at the very best highly confused and at the worst unconscious. So you're not going to be able to say, well, how's your near triad? Are you able to look at a near target? Not going to work. So you need to be able to see signs that don't require participation. And the blown unresponsive pupil is that. There's one other sign that we'll look at later, which is a, 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 um, a down and out 
um, eye. So the eye, because of the loss of, um, of the uh, extraocular muscles that are innervated by the cranial nerve 3, um, it's, it's brought out by the lateral abducens, by the abducens um, nerve, which is intact, and the superior oblique, which is intact. Um, one other thing that, you, that will accompany uh, this is, is atosis. Remember that the levator palpebrae is also innervated by cranial nerve 3. But the critical one that you really want to ha hammer on is the blown unresponsive pupil. Okay, so we're going to leave, I know it's hard, but we're going to leave extraocular land and move on to the trigeminal nerve. Thank you.